Good morning. Welcome back to another Planet Doug, another exciting Planet Doug behind the scenes video, another exciting walking around in Kuala Lumpur behind the scenes video for Friday, April 12th. And I'm walking around again because I'm heading out to meet a friend of mine, someone that I met through my uh, YouTube channel. And we're meeting for lunch at a place called the Lot 10 Hutong Food Court, which I guess is uh, in a shopping mall in the uh, like Bukit Bintang area. I've heard about this place a lot. A lot of YouTubers actually feature this food court because they've heard that it's a special place and they go there and put it in their videos. And um, yeah, even my friend Daryl, Wander Eats channel, food expert, he's recommended it that I should go check this place out. So when uh, the guy I'm meeting today, Justin, when he uh, said he was going to be in town and uh, would I like to get together for lunch or dinner or something, um, I suggested meeting here. And I don't know whether it's a good place or not because for a conversation, I usually like a quiet place where you can sit in comfort at a table and get organized. And I don't know what this food court is like. Some uh, food courts are big and have a lot of room. But uh, Justin did say, when we made this arrangement, he said, be warned, it's a little bit of a crowded, busy place. And we're meeting right at 12 o'clock, right at lunchtime, which on my own is something that I never do. If I was going to go to this place on my own, just to have lunch or shoot a video. Um, I would go there at 2.30, 3 in the afternoon, something like that. I always avoid the normal times to avoid the rush. But if you're meeting other people, of course, they generally suggest the actual lunch time or the actual breakfast time or dinner time. According to Google Maps, it's about 30 minutes away, regardless of how you get there. So. If I went by a MRT, LRT combination, it would take 30 minutes. And if I walk, it will also take 30 minutes. And I decided to go on foot today. Just because, since I'm shooting a behind the scenes video, do, doing some talking, I thought maybe it would be uh, more relaxing to do that talking while I'm walking rather than standing on a, a subway car. I've done a lot of that lately. Works out fine for me. But honestly, when you go through these big LRT and MRT stations, just entering them and getting to your platform, you put all of that together, it actually adds up to a lot of walking, a lot more than you'd think. And the LRT, MRT route goes in a big circle. So the actual distance you cover is much farther than the straight line. So in the end, even if I took the MRT, chances are, I would walk just as far as I would walking. It would just be a lot cooler because the sun is out. Let me give you a look around. You can see what the weather is like in Malaysia these days, or at least in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Beautiful sunny skies. Up there, the Maybank Tower. I've heard that Maybank is going to be moving into the Merdeka 118 building. I don't know whether that's confirmed or not, but someone told me that long ago. And if they do move out of their Maybank Tower, what will happen to this tower? Interesting question. So I'll be following this road for most of the way there and then curving to the right to go into a Bukit Bintang. And there's actually a Go KL bus that I could hop on. It, it takes this route. And maybe if I go by a bus station and a Go KL just happens to be coming up behind me, I could hop on. And speaking of moving from the Maybank to the Merdeka 118 building, there's both of them. So yeah, beautiful skies, as I said. Nice weather today. And this, I believe, is the... Uh, 
uh, Malaysian Stock Exchange building, the Bursa Malaysia. I remember looking that up one time and I've never forgotten. So that's where all the money flows through up there. So what's on my mind this morning? Well, a lot. Uh, first thing, maybe I've told myself this morning I should talk about this because I need to make it a reality. I've been ignoring it for a long time. And sometimes when you speak something, it's like you bring it into focus, you bring it into existence. And this is the fact that in about two and a half weeks, apparently I'm going to Vietnam. <laughs> it's a funny story. I don't think anybody else lives their life this way. Nobody should. But when I was in uh, Sumatra, um, I was busy making arrangements to come back here. And again, the only reason really that I was coming back here is that my visa for Sumatra was expiring. So I had to leave the country. And uh, so I hopped on a ferry, came back to Malaysia. And, but now Malaysia has this new system where before you arrive, you have to fill out an online arrival, declar an arrival card. And it asks for all of your biographical details, passport number, name, phone number, hotel, uh, how you're coming into the country, how you're leaving. And this is a brand new thing, and I didn't really know how it worked. So I decided to, to be safe. On the safe side, I decided to book a flight before I do this so that I have an actual confirmed flight out of Malaysia in case the system asks me for one. So what I, what I was doing at that time, I just wanted to book a flight, any flight. So I was looking for essentially the easiest, shortest, cheapest flight I could find. I only wanted it to, to show immigration. I wasn't necessarily going to use it it was just something I needed to do for the paperwork and for the visa. So, I booked a flight to Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. That was the least expensive flight that I could find, assuming if I decide to go somewhere else, I would be losing the least amount of money. Here is uh, Jalan Bukit Nanas. Jalan means street or road. So this is Bukit Nanas Road. And Bukit Nanas is uh, over there, the hill, basically. And that's where KL Tower is located. And that's where the Eco Park is located. So you can see a sign for it there. Hutan Simpan Bukit Nanas, the Taiwan uh, forest. Kuala Lumpur Forest uh, Eco Park. So that's where I am right now. This fence up ahead has been here for a very long time. And I, kept I keep expecting to see a giant building rising up behind it because it has to be a big construction project. But I've seen this wall, I think for years, and uh, it's getting more and more overgrown. Looks like there's a jungle growing back there. But so far, there's no evidence of a new skyscraper emerging. And I never hear any noise from back there. I never see any trucks going in and out. So I'm assuming it's a big construction project. But they just haven't started yet. So they've bought the land. They're making their plans. They boarded it up, keep people out, but they haven't started building yet, I don't think. Anyway, when I came back to Malaysia, I thought, as I always did, I thought I had plenty of time to make plans, and I just assumed that over time, something would develop. My life would move in a certain direction. But as I've discovered recently, that when you're making YouTube videos, time goes by really fast, and you always have something to do. You've always got videos to edit, you've always got places to go, things to explore, video to shoot, 
and the days go by very pleasurably. So, there goes the Go KL bus. Had I waited for it, <laughs> it would have caught up with me right here. But uh, then I wouldn't get to see the world around me like I'm doing now. Uh, anyway, as often happens, time went by and then nothing really got into focus about what I'm going to do when my visa for Malaysia expires and my visa expires on May 4th and I booked this flight long ago I booked this flight before I even came to Malaysia and I booked it for May 2nd just to give me a two or three day uh, window if something goes wrong with the flight I still have time to get out of the country so I don't like to book a flight on the last day of my visa even a flight I didn't think I was going to use so now it is, uh, what, did, what did I say is it? It's April 12th. So let me do some quick calculations. I did the math and it's roughly three weeks. Actually, it's a bit longer than I thought. I thought it was only two weeks away, but three weeks away. Essentially, apparently, I'm on a flight to Ho Chi Minh City. And it's a bit of an odd thing because by this point, according to my plans, I was supposed to be sort of free and clear and able to go anywhere I wanted, but even after all this time, I still find I have sort of deep roots here in, in Kuala Lumpur, all kinds of things I'm in the middle of, things I want to do, and I don't feel completely ready to leave yet, but the clock is ticking. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to say <laughs> that apparently, on May 2nd, I'm going to be on a flight to Ho Chi Minh City. And I don't know anything at all yet. Um, again, I wanted, to, I wanted to say it and say it publicly because then it becomes real. And then I'll start getting busy. I have to get a, a visa for Vietnam. I have to figure out how that works. To figure out uh, where I'm going to stay. Am I going to be traveling around the country? What am I going to do when I'm getting there? and it would be a very interesting place to live and really a good place to base myself right now anyway close to malaysia um, close to people that i know here in case i need to come back and it's not a not a long journey but anyway it's all very vague at the moment and i've got to start looking into getting a tourist visa figuring out and just getting excited about going to vietnam and the way i get excited i find is by looking at photographs so until I see pictures of a place, it, it's never, it never seems real to me. So what I need to do is just basically get on the internet and start watching videos from Vietnam, travelers in Vietnam, find a lot of photographs of the city, the life there, and then I will get uh, excited about this relatively new destination. It's not completely new because I've been to Vietnam before, but only one time. And it was an extremely long time ago. So long ago that, to be honest, it's, it's a completely different country now. It's changed dramatically from when I was there. And I've probably changed as well, so it will be a brand new uh, experience. So heading into the uh, downtown or Bukit Bintang area. Another bank up there, the Am Bank. Condo buildings and bank buildings and giant hotels. This is the Weld. This building right up above me is the Weld. Manara Weld. And you wouldn't think it, but I've noticed that when you walk up here to Bukit Bintang, you are climbing uphill to a certain extent. It's a very gradual, gentle slope. There's the Wisma New Asia. I don't know what that building is exactly. And over here, another bank. 
Republic Bank. The Manhattan over there looks very fancy. I'm about 10 minutes away from where I need to be. Another just three quarters of a kilometer, I guess. Going up to an intersection. I actually, I join up with the monorail up ahead and then the monorail goes off into uh, Bukit Bintang, Imbi Station, places like that. I'm just, I'm trying to slow down a little bit because I, I don't want to arrive hot and sweaty. For some reason, over the last couple of weeks, I got in the habit of wearing uh, long pants. I dug these long pants out of storage when I came back here to KL and put them on and I just felt good. I felt more mature, felt like an adult, felt like a man instead of a, a little boy running around all the time in t-shirts, shorts and uh, sandals. So. And then when I wear these pants and I'm meeting someone like Justin for lunch, I thought I would be a little bit more formal and I put on one of my embassy t-shirts, but this shirt is pretty hot. So I'm getting a little bit sweaty. That's not always the best way to arrive somewhere to enjoy a meal. So in the world of uh, Planet Doug, what's going on? Uh, I have a few videos that I'm working on. The main one right now, I'm basically finished. I finished the original, what I think of as the extended cut, the uh, Planet Doug version. I finished that yesterday and exported it. And the video is about a, a trip I went on, a, just a, a place I visited here in KL. And I went there with Jamie, my American friend Jamie, when he was here. And he picked out the place, suggested we could go there. And it was a really good call. It was a very interesting trip. We went to the Tunku Abdul Rahman uh, Memorial. And the Tunku, as you may or may not know, was the uh, first prime minister of Malaysia. And uh, according to what I read, and according to what I saw at the memorial, which was in fact a huge museum, not just a simple memorial, it was a full-on museum dedicated to uh, the Tunku and his life. But according to what I read there, he is uh, considered to be the father of Malaysia because he was so instrumental in the process negotiating with the British and the, just the overall, the independence struggle, the independence movement that brought us to where we are today with the independent country of Malaysia. So I went there to take a look at it. And uh, as I normally do, and especially when you're with someone like Jamie, I walked there. So the first part of the video was all about basically what I'm doing right now, just walking to get somewhere and talking a lot about what I'm seeing around me and all the various um, streets and options and transportation to get there. So I'm at the corner. Another big uh, construction project over there. Looks like they're renovating that building. The uh, foundations look uh, original, look old. The Waldorf Astoria. Huh. A lot of noise here. And yeah, this is quite the intersection right here. I was here the other day. There's the uh, pavilion building, Burjaya Times Square over there. And if you come around here to this uh, corner, you'll see just how many tall buildings there are right here. And this is the monorail that I mentioned. The monorail track goes by here. But yeah. There's so many tall buildings, it's almost like being in a forest. You can't see the forest for the trees. But yeah, as you walk around, there's tall buildings hiding behind other tall buildings. Uh, looks like it might have a couple of seconds to get across. Yeah, there we 
we are in the middle of the intersection looking in that direction check that uh skyscraper after skyscraper patronus towers So the main video about going to the memorial to Malaysia's founding father, the Tunku, it is done. And I'm kind of pleased with it. I like the way it turned out. And it's not going to set YouTube on fire. But from my perspective, I thought everything came together rather nicely. The walk to get there, some interesting things along the way. And... Uh, Jamie was with me the whole time, but I, I didn't make him part of the video. I didn't put a microphone on him or anything. He's just there in the background. And we would go through the memorial. There are actually um, three, well, four major sites there, not just the memorial to the first prime minister. There was also a big memorial museum dedicated to the third prime minister, Tun Hussein On. And then there was another museum that we didn't have time to go to. I think it was about a whole bunch of other prime ministers and the history of Malaysia. And then there was the, uh, the home of the Tunku, the official residence of the prime minister. It's there as well, fully restored, but it wasn't open, I don't think. So we didn't go inside it, just looked at it from the outside. But I did some reading before I went there. So I knew a few things. I learned a lot more as I went through the various memorials and I talked about everything that I saw. The habit I have for shooting these videos, which works out well for me, is that I don't shoot any video when I go through the museum. So for example, the Tunku Museum had three floors and I would go into the first floor with Jamie and then I'm just holding the camera at my side. I'm not vlogging as I'm doing now. I'm just holding the camera in my hand, just dangling at my waist. And then I just go through the uh, museum like a normal visitor would, looking at everything, reading everything, talking with Jamie, absorbing everything. And then after I go through the entire first floor, I told Jamie, yeah, just give me a minute. And I cut him loose. And then I get out my camera and I go through the first floor a second time. And now I'm filming but it's not as erratic as it might be had I done that from the beginning because now I, I know a little bit about what I'm looking at and I focus on uh, certain things. Ooh. They always say look for the crowds to find good people or good restaurants I mean and uh, Damascus it looks like it falls into that category because they even have a big lineup here red velvet ropes <laughs> and is divided into two sections one side for dine-in one side for takeaway like shawarma things like that and there's a lunchtime crowd is building up mm -hmm -hmm. looks good they always look so good don't they it's hard to resist they have a uh, the perfect marketing technique, don't they? Just having this out on display right on the street. So, oh, okay. I didn't even know what Lot 10 was. Now I remember I've seen it before. And it is, it is a shopping mall. A big green one, as it turns out. There it is. Lot 10. Oh, I hear the monorail. That's a Bukit Bintang station on the monorail. The uh, Bukit Bintang MRT is right here as well. It's just around the corner from the, uh, the monorail station. But uh, yeah, here's an entrance to uh, the MRT right here, I think. But there's a uh, lot 10. And I'm 10 minutes early. But now I still have to find the uh, food court. I just got a message from Justin, he's there now and uh, waiting outside the mall out on the street so i should be able to find him pretty easily but yeah just to finish that uh, uh how do i cross the street i might i might have to go into the uh mrt to uh, cross over
So yeah, what I did on the first floor, I went through it with Jamie, and then I went through it a second time, talking about all the exhibits, and then quite often, I would then go through it a third time, but then I would just be shooting B-roll, as if I'm some kind of a YouTube professional, and I would uh, take a lot of, uh, oh, I was gonna take a picture of Lot 10, but I forgot. I and I take a lot of photographs as I go through the exhibit a third time. And then we moved up to the second floor and I just did the same thing. Went through it with Jamie, read everything, looked at everything. And then I doubled back for a second trip and took video, then a third trip taking uh, pictures. And I did that throughout the entire uh, Tunku Memorial and then the uh, Tun Hussein Memorial and then walking around the outside. And then when I put all of it together, I don't know, it seemed to, I think I, I sort of knew what I was talking about by then. And I didn't make too many dumb mistakes. I didn't stumble over my words too many times. And I had a few important points about each prime minister that I wanted to focus on. And for my money, the, the story of the video, the images in it, it came together well and I concluded with the idea that this was a much more interesting place than I expected and um, I had never really heard about it so I concluded that it really was a hidden gem of Kuala Lumpur that was my takeaway really worth well worth visiting and not a lot of people know about it so it would qualify as a, a hidden gem and the last thing about this story is that I finished the main video and then this morning I decided to see if it was worthwhile to make a short version and I did that this morning and I kind of like the short version too. Uh, took out like the whole section of walking to the memorial, I just deleted all of that, deleted a bunch of rambling portions, tightened everything up, added some more information like made it a more, more of a how-to video, how to get there, what's there, how to do things. And um, so the short version is about 30 minutes long. The long version is about an hour. And then I'll probably end up posting two, both of them. But what I'm going to do this time is, um, I think I'll post the long version first because that's what I feel at. That's what comes from the heart. The uh, Planet Doug version, the extended cut, that's the real video as far as I'm concerned. And um, I'm going to, uh, post that one first I think and just sort of see see how people uh, there's Justin he was looking for me and I was looking for him and then I'll post the short one later on I'm gonna take a picture yeah my 10 <laughs> so there's a uh, there's lot 10 very green as I said bright bright primary green. I just want to come out here and take a photograph of it for my relive video project. And then there's a, there's Justin right there. Yeah, uh, down there is like a main house, so there's no way you can find me. I was down there. Oh, okay. You can find a corner, but oh, it's very cornery over there. But it's is, it, is it too busy? Like, did you want to go somewhere else if it's too crazy no, it's down not, there? it's nice and convenient. You haven't been here. You wanted to YouTube, yeah. isn't it? I, I mean, I could check it out on another day if no, I no, wanted no, to. No. Since we are already here, we'll go down okay. there. Okay. All right, yeah, cool. But it's just very constrained and constricted. That's, I'm just warning you. Do you but mind okay. being on video just for a minute? I don't I, I'm doing a behind-the-scenes video. I don't mind at all, but you might mind because I charge X dollars per minute. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm right. Well, I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, no, well, I'm either way, I'm okay. While I was walking here, I mentioned I'm coming here to meet Justin. We're oh, going okay. to, so I thought so, I would, no, so. No, 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 good, yeah. <laughs> so talk to me now, okay? Yeah, just for a minute. Do I say anything or do I just keep Maybe I'll ask shot? you a question. Okay, yeah. I, ask me a few questions. Yeah, maybe. Oh, why not do anything? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, why not? Well, <laughs> I, I, I don't even know. Okay. Motorcycles. Okay. Right. <laughs> so I'm here at Lot 10 where I'm meeting Justin for, it's at the Lot 10 Hutong Food Court. Do That's you know, correct, yeah. Do you know what hutong means? Hutong is a Chinese word, it's a Mandarin word uh, used in northern China and Beijing. If you go to Beijing and you say hutong, it's, hutong is basically a back alley. 
and people oh, live see. off the back alley and off the streets. It's a tourist scene in itself. Of course, they have modernized it now and it's very beautiful. It's for tourists. Basically, it means back alley or back street where uh -huh. a lot of poorer families used to live. I see. So it's not a type of food. It's more. Oh, no, no. It's they've it's got all a, kinds a, of different no, foods because the food. Back street or back food. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Because if you go down there, it's basically like a hutong. It's very jam packed with people. You know, every corner there's people. It's quite constricted. It's quite constrained, but it's nice. You know, okay. it's very lively atmosphere. We're gonna, we're gonna check it out. Yes. Maybe I can put a microphone on you, yes. and then we can walk around. You can point out all the different types of food to me. Okay. I think you know a lot about food, right? Oh, I think you know more. You have lived no, in I, Malaysia longer than me. <laughs> I just, I just don't remember the names of dishes or anything like that. Oh, I think, I'm not a foodie. I think you are good, but only your pronunciation is <laughs> atrocious. But <laughs> because you can't pronounce the local way, but I pronounce the local way. Right, right, I right. Follow your videos on Sumatra. And your pronunciation, oh, <laughs> nothing to write home about. Sorry, Doc. Atrocious, he said. I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. Um, yes. So we met one other time. Yes. Right? You know me through my YouTube channel. Yes. And you brought me to a special restaurant last time. What kind of yes. food was that again? Oh, that was Nyonya Colors. Nyonya. Nyonya Colors. And Nyonya and Baba, do you know something about yeah, them? Yeah, a little bit. They, uh, they were long emigrated Chinese from China but they have since assimilated into Malay society and therefore their culture, their foods are a mixture of both although they are not Muslims but they eat a lot of Malay food and oh, it's chili so their, their diet, their, their, their cuisine has totally changed mm -hmm. and, and, and you refer to the men as Baba and the ladies as Nyonya yeah, so they are yeah. just long-term ex-China immigrants into Malaysia See, he does know a lot about food, a lot oh, more than I do. I used to live here. I was born here. I was born in Malacca. Malacca right, has, right. A, has a lot of um, Dionias and Babas because you was one of the earliest settled by China colonies down there. And you're based in Australia now. I live in Perth now. You're right, right. I've been there for the last 40 over years. Right, yeah. right, right. I am what they call a banana. Uh, yeah. This yellow on the outside and white on the inside. Right. <laughs> what about but my, my, but my diet is Malay. Okay. If, you, if I have a choice of all the food, Malay, and then Indian, Mama, <laughs> and then maybe Nyonya and Chinese last. Sorry. <laughs> I got it. Okay. How long are you in Malaysia this time? You're here on a holiday, right? Visiting friends, family. Yes. yes. I come back quite often. Being retired, uh, I am uh, 68 years old. Don't know whether I should sit there. Why? So I'm retired, nothing much to do, trying to be relevant. And so I do come back every three months, three, four months. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. So head inside and yeah, uh, yeah maybe uh, do you, can you give me a tour of Lot 10? Okay. If I put a microphone on you for better audio. Yeah. You mean the food court? Right? Yeah, the food court. Yeah, not, not the shopping mall. Yeah. Okay. And then I'll sort of stand away from you a little bit and sort of film you like you're my star, you know? <laughs> we'll see what happens. All right. So we're down at uh, the food court now, Hutong Food Court. Ah, there's actually a sign for it right here. Lot 10 Hutong. And I assume those are the Chinese characters? Yes, yes, says you are right. Hutong. Yes, you are right, that one. And it, yeah, it is um, more packed, like more, like food courts are normally really wide and spacious. This one looks a little more crowded together. Okay. Have you eaten here before? Yes, I have. Yes, yeah? yes I have. Uh, and what's your favorite when you come here? Uh, my favorite, I would normally like to look for Malay food rather than uh, Chinese food. All yeah. oh, right, you yeah. said, yeah, Malay food. But here is more, Malay, more Chinese food than Malay food. More Malay than Chinese? No, more Chinese than Malay food. Oh, I see. So when you say Malay food, what are you talking about? What kind of dishes? Malay dishes, mee rebus, mee siam, okay. uh, Malay mixed rice, nasi lemak, rather than Chinese noodles and bihun and kuei tiao and uh, cha kuei tiao. Yeah, I know so little about food. Like if I ordered a bowl of noodles, I wouldn't know if it was Malay noodles or Chinese. It's just noodles ah, to me. That's but. one very easy way to tell. Okay. Malays always come with chili. 
Always come with chicken. Yeah, chili, chili. Oh, chili. Yeah, anything that's chili or spicy would most probably will not be Chinese. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Anything that's plain, right? There's no chili inside. Obviously, it's Chinese. Ah. Okay. Yes. So, how G? So the. This is typical Chinese. Malays wouldn't have this. This is typical Chinese. Typ typical Chinese. Typical Chinese, yeah. Chinese roast. Yeah, if you go over there, you can get a better view of the chicken and stuff. Right. Yeah. This will definitely be Chinese. As you can see, there's sausage, so there's pork. And uh, the Muslims, the Malays, don't eat pork. Right, okay, that's yeah. another good way to tell. No, that's another good way to tell, yes. And uh, some of the dishes. And uh, if you scan over there, all those uh, herbal medicines and stuff, ah. those are obviously Chinese again. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah, that, that yeah, makes yeah, sense. So, yeah. They're all they Chinese make cold again. and hot tea? Yes. Yes. The herbal jelly and herbal tea. And, oh yeah, hot and cold. Of course, if you see Chinese characters, obviously they are all Chinese, right. Chinese food, yeah. But it looks like there's a history to this place, or Bukit Bintang. Oh, yeah. The history of Lot 10, yeah. Bintang. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I'll have to watch that later on. Uh, they have English subtitles. Yes. Oh, it's, look, he's, he has a 360 camera. Yeah, it's quite fashionable, or, or USP, unique selling point, to start a little history that you've been around for so long to give credence to the business. Right, of yeah. course. Yeah. Whether how true the story is, uh, is another matter. Yeah, okay. we, can, we can move along here. Eh? Yeah, it's busy, but it's not It's not crazy busy. This is okay. I think today it's not a holiday. Yesterday was crazy. Oh yeah? Yesterday and day before was crazy. Today, has, people have gone back to work. No more Hari Raya. Yeah. Yes. It looks like they have more seating off in this direction. That's what I'm always worried about, seating. Uh, uh, this one here, uh, dark, if you move over, you yeah. move through. this one here is very Malaysian. You don't oh. find this in China. Okay. You don't find this, or not in this form and what, it's just very Malaysian. It's a mixture of Malay and Chinese. In fact, this word Bandung is Indonesian, as you right. can see. And this is Chinese, as you can see. And some of them will be Malay, so it's a mixture of everything. Uh, okay. Now, this chendo itself is Malay. Okay, right. whether this ching chow is Chinese wood, uh. it's Chinese. So here's a mixture. Of, this is very typical Malaysian. You don't even find it in China. Yeah. Is there some disagreement about where chendo comes from? Like, who, it, what it, country can say it is ours? Yes. Be between countries, Indonesia say they started it. Yeah. Singapore said, no, no, we are the ones. But Malaysians said, no, no, we are the ones. But even within Malaysia, Malacca will claim, no, we started it. And Penang will claim, no, we started it. Right, that's what I heard. Yes. Yeah. So. But Chendol itself, the little green stuff, is made of a pungent leaf. Uh, right. Yeah, called um, or the name a uh, pandan. It's called pandan, pandan leaf, pandan. Yeah. And, and it's grounded pandan leaf. With right. Beans. Okay. Yes. Huh. All right. <laughs> You're the perfect guide. Honky <laughs> uh, porridge. Yes. Yes. Now, porridge is very Chinese, obviously. Malays don't eat porridge. Uh, yeah. Dumplings are all very Chinese. You're right. Yeah. Even, even I know that, I think. Right. Yeah, yeah. Dumplings are, in fact, very Cantonese and very Shanghainese. Okay. Yeah. And even the, if you want to split hairs, Shanghainese dumplings and Cantonese dumplings are totally different and different tastes again. Yeah. Okay. So for for a tour, I think that's that's good enough. Yes. Uh, what 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 do you think uh, we should have today? I am very easy. It's really you who wants to go and do the picking. Yeah. Yeah. Very wow. easy. Yeah. I have such a hard time making up my mind. Yeah. 
Perhaps if you walk along and then you ask me what is it and I can explain then you can make a better decision. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'll shut down the GoPro and okay. we can just walk around, relax okay. a little bit yes. and, uh, Why not? Yeah. and I'll make up my mind. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to turn off the camera, take a little bit of a closer look and try to come up with something uh, tasty for lunch. Justin is uh, ordering some food and uh, the basic idea was did I was I in the mood for noodles or for rice it's really hard for me to narrow things down and I eventually settled on I was feeling like rice more than noodles and we happened to be standing in front of this place that had some hok hockey braised pork with rice and soup and different things and he's he's down there getting some and he sent me off to find a table and uh, I think we can sit here I think as far as tables go this probably falls in the planet Doug world of one of the worst tables here but <laughs> it was the only table that was free it was the only table I could find. Is, is it a better one? Okay. You see, other people, they know. He just took one look at this table and nah, we can't sit there. <laughs> That's where Planet Doug sits, not, uh, not Justin. Now nah, he, he found a better table. Oh, I guess we're adjoining someone else. So Justin brought the food that I ordered. Did you get a similar dish or you got a, you're getting food somewhere else? Uh, I have to ask for your forgiveness. Okay. I just finished my brunch. Okay. So I won't push myself. I'm going to have order a drink, definitely. Okay. And then maybe later, if I feel up to it, then I'll talk. I won't torture myself. <laughs> now, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. So you were going to tell me about what? Let me adjust this GoPro. This thing's too long. So you're going to tell me about this uh, food. What what have I got here? Okay, so so Doug has chosen uh, the Fuzhou or Hock Chiu cuisine today. He has chosen a set, a braised pork set. So this is typically Hock Chiu food. He has also chosen a peanut uh, savory sweet soup, which is typically Hock Chiu. Hopefully he likes it. Okay, <laughs> I'm sure I will. Okay, let's uh, dive in. So Justin is uh, getting some drinks, and I thought, uh, yeah, he said just uh, help yourself to your lunch and uh, just dive in. So I'm going to give this all a, a taste. I'm mainly interested in the flavor of the pork and then the flavor of the uh, peanut soup. Um, yeah, let's give this a try. Nice flavor. Again, no food expert. Nice sauce, very moist, very tender. Tastes good to me. More important to me is, um, does it really suit my mood? Because I'm famous for ordering the wrong thing. I'll order something, then I'll sit down, it's like, ah, it's not really what I wanted. And right now I was thinking I wanted rice and something with a lot of protein. So this pork dish will be really good. Yeah. It reminds me of adobe, like um, a Filipino food, pork adobo. Pork adobo? Got a little bit of a, that. Maybe I'm totally wrong, but that it reminds me of that. And I was thinking when Justin reached out to me, I was, I was going to suggest going for Filipino food at the uh, Filipino restaurant near my hotel. Ooh, look at that. The soup is much thicker than I realized. Look at that. It's not really a broth at all. A lot of white peanuts. And uh, I don't know what this other stuff is. Ah, it looks very interesting. I have a feeling this peanut soup is going to be the star of this meal. Let's give this a try. Hmm. Sweet. Yeah, a little bit of a, a little bit of sweet sweetness to it. 
not a strong flavor, very light flavoring. It, it, to be honest, it um, tastes like peanuts, like a peanut broth. But there are some other ingredients in here. <clears throat> I don't know what any of it is. But yeah, it's good. <clears throat> be very hearty and very filling. And we have a couple of drinks coming. This is duck soya bean. Soya bean? Milk. Soya bean milk. This is tasty kosong ice. All right. So we got a little bit of variety going. How's the food so far? It's good. Good. I was just saying, it reminded me of a Filipino dish, pork adobo. Oh, yes, yes, yes. A little bit of a flavor similar to that. Yeah. I'm going to sample this, and then I'll put the camera away and then just enjoy uh, chatting with Justin. Yeah. Yeah, it's the, nice. The Filipinos, being, being Christians, are great pork eaters, right. like, the, like the Chinese people. A lot right. of their cuisine is a pork, in terms of all sorts of pork. That's true. I had a lot of this when I was in Sumatra. Okay. A lot of soy milk, I really like it. Yes, and if, you, if you've got a choice here, don't have, you have this and you ask them to add chain chow, which is called the black jelly, okay. black, black, gra black grass jelly. You put it inside, it's, it's, it's a really real good. nice combination. Okay. It's not available here, I was going to ask them for it. Uh, they don't have it? Next time? Yes. All right. Yes. So, thank you, Justin. <laughs> Gonna dive in and enjoy You're this, welcome, Doc. and uh, I'll come back to the video once uh, once lunch is over. Lunch is over. Uh, Justin is uh, heading back to his hotel. I'm heading back to mine. A yeah, really nice lunch, and then we had a he had chendol, and I had like an iced mango sort of dessert, which is really nice. Yeah, interesting food court. Really crowded though, a lot of people there. And as you're sitting there eating, you feel a bit guilty that you're um, occupying a table because everybody is walking up and down, up and down. Everybody's looking for a table all the time, just like I was when I first got there. But uh, yeah, not a lot of elbow room down there. So, yeah, this is where I, uh, this is where I was, there's, Lot 10 over there. Here in the heart of uh, Bukit Bintang, there's Pavilion Mall just down there. Very famous place. I'm going to go back to my hotel pretty much the same way, go down the same street, but just to mix it up, I'm going to cross over to the other side of this street. I could hop into the MRT right here that would be a pretty easy way to get back, but why not go for another walk and then just look up at all the, uh, the tall buildings as I go. Other than going to Laoyat Plaza, which is back there, or around the corner actually, I don't have a lot of reasons ever to come down here. I think this is the most happening Certainly the most happening tourism area of Kuala Lumpur. But I, I do find it's a little bit busy for me when I come down here. There's just too many people, too much going on. Maybe that's why I don't end up down here that often. But uh, yeah, a lot of restaurants to check out. Oh, oh yeah, there's that place I saw when I first came here, Damascus, with a good shawarma, big lineup of people. I'll bet if you check online on Google Maps, they'll have a very high ratings. And there's the, the Bukit Bintang monorail station. So we're going to follow the monorail tracks down this way for a little bit. A whole bunch more uh, restaurants up here. Another shawarma kebab place right over there. Yeah, seem to be a lot of uh, Arabic foods right around here.
And this is a behind the scenes video, so I must have stories to tell. <laughs> and I always do. I don't know if I've been talking a lot about technology recently, but I do have some technology adventures. Yeah, I don't know how these things always seem to happen to me. There's got to be a reason. But uh, someone left a comment on a video of mine recently saying, I'd, I've been trying to get in touch with you and I send you an email at the email address that is listed on YouTube and it wouldn't go through. It kept bouncing back and saying like well, they can't deliver this email to that address. So they mentioned that in this comment. So I thought, oh, what's going on there? And then I sent myself an email to that same Planet Doug email address and I got the same response. It, was, it came back as undeliverable. So something had gone wrong with that email address. And I must admit my heart sank when I realized that because a lot of these things that you do as part of a YouTube channel, like buying a domain name, because I purchased the Planet Doug domain name. And I did that mainly because I wanted to set up Planet Doug email addresses. So once you have a domain, in my case, I purchased the domain planetdoug.life, so that, that's my website name. And once you own that domain and you have it hosted with a hosting company, you can open up email accounts. And the email goes to Planet Doug. So, and you can make as many email addresses as you want and give them uh, any, any name that you'd like. So instead of sending an email to my personal Gmail account or something like that, I made an email address called Doug at planetdoug.life. That was my Planet Doug email address. And I put that on YouTube. And uh, I, I had no idea how to do any of that before. This is something I had to figure out. I had no idea how do you... I didn't know you could make an email address, a private email address. I didn't know how it worked. But I did all the research, I figured it all out. This took a long time, it was a period of time, over a couple of weeks probably, sorry, when I was uh, figuring all this out. But then I finally had, got it done. And I had my own email addresses, private ones. But that was so long ago, I don't remember what I did. It's not like it's something I do every day. So I did it once, and then I basically just forgot about it. But now that there was a problem with that email address, I didn't know how to fix it. I didn't even remember how I did it in the first place. I had no memory of it. So I had to start all over again from the beginning, relearning all of this stuff. And all I could remember was, well, it was connected to my website, right, planetdoug.life. So I thought, well, I'll start there. So I went, I logged into my website. It's a WordPress website. So I went into my, you know, the back end of my website into my, the WordPress code, the WordPress dashboard basically. And I'm looking around in there thinking, okay, is this where the email is? Did I make it here? Where can I find it? Oh, by the way, I stopped walking because there's a view of uh, tall buildings. I just wanted to turn the GoPro around, get some of those uh, tall buildings up there. Still walking along the uh, monorail. But yeah, I was just trying to refresh my memory about, okay, how did I even make this email address? Because I had to, before I could fix it, I had to find it. And I didn't really know where it was. And I eventually concluded, well, okay, it's not at my website. So it must be through my hosting company because you buy the domain. I bought the domain from GoDaddy, but then GoDaddy just sell, sold me the domain, gave me the rights to it. But then I bought hosting on, an, on a server from another company. And there you have what's called an AMP, which is your dashboard there. So I log on to my AMP and to be honest, the last time I logged on to my AMP was so long ago, I can't even remember it. 
So there I am on my AMP looking around for my email. Like, okay, did I do it here? Where are my email addresses? How do you make an email address? I'm doing all this research all over again, but I couldn't find it there either. It was nowhere on the AMP. And there was one more place I could go. I thought, okay, if it's not at my WordPress dashboard, it's not at my hosting AMP dashboard, it has to be in cPanel because cPanel is where you do all the technical work for your, Word, for your WordPress website, for anything you do behind the scenes, all the mechanics is all taken care of by cPanel. What do I know about cPanel? But anyway, now I had to figure out, okay, what was my username for cPanel? Where is cPanel? Uh, what was my password for cPanel? I had to figure all that out. So I finally logged into my cPanel and ah, finally, I started to see some things that look familiar and I remembered, okay, this is where you make your emails, addresses in, in uh, cPanel. So I went roaming around the system there and I found a listing that would list all of your email addresses that you have. And of course, the one that wasn't working, it wasn't there. I had, I created some other email addresses, but the one I made for YouTube, for people to write to me on my YouTube channel, it just wasn't there. It was gone. I had four, yeah, four different email addresses that I created, and the one that was broken, well, there's a very good reason it was broken. It had vanished. So, no idea. I have no clue how that could have happened. The only thing that makes sense is that I deleted it myself. There's no other way it could be gone. So I must have deleted it. I must have had a reason for doing it, but I have no memory of doing it. I can't think of any reason why I would have done it. But for whatever reason, that email address, Doug at planetdoug.life, just wasn't there anymore. And that's why it wasn't working. So then, I had to figure out what to do. I didn't want to create the same one, but I already had another email address sitting there that I called info at planetdoug.life. And that was what I thought that would be more like my business email. If Planet Doug was some kind of a roaring commercial success and some company wanted to reach out to me, the email address I would give to them would be info at planetdoug.life. And I had that email address. It was still there in my cPanel. And uh, I thought, well, why don't I just use that one across the board? And I decided to make that one my main contact email for Planet Doug. But then I had to see whether or not it was still working. And again, this is so complicated. I learned all this at the time, but I, I still don't really understand it, is that when you create an email address based on your website domain name, and you have it in cPanel, then if someone sends you an email, where does it go, right? I'm so used to Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo Mail, all the things I've used during my life, I think, well, that's where emails go, right? And now I created this email address. It exists, it works. People can send emails to that address, but where does it go? Um, I, I, this is a real mystery to me. And it turns out it was a real mystery because having the email address is one thing, but then you also need some kind of an email client that manages the emails that are sent to that address, if that makes any sense at all. In my mind, it's a little bit like you have an address where you live, your house, but all it is is a number and a word. That's your address. But if somebody sends a letter to that address, it actually has to go somewhere. It has to go into a mailbox. And you put a mailbox on the outside of your house and the mailman puts the letter 
into the physical mailbox. And as far as I understand things, that is the email client. So now that I had an email address, I needed an email client in order to receive the emails and reply to them. And when you do this through my hosting package, what they offer you is something called RoundCube. So RoundCube is this email uh, client that exists as part of a, of a website or something. I so I have that, so I could send an email to myself and in RoundCube, and again, you have to sign up for this. You have to, you have a username and a password. So I've got the email address. I've got the RoundCube client with a username and password. I log into it and now oh, there are the emails. All the emails I've been sending to myself as a test showed up in RoundCube. And that's good but it's not great because I don't have round cube on my phone. So even if someone sends me an email, I don't have access to it until I get onto a computer, log into my C panel, and then log into round cube, which is a very awkward and it's like, is this what everybody does? It seems so difficult to me. So that was the next stage was to figure out how to deal with this problem. So yeah, I'm back here. This is a street that I walked down before. When I came up, I was on the other side of the street and I talked about the Weld. That's the Weld building that you can see. Kind of a crazy intersection. There goes a Go KL bus. That's the one I would have taken. That's going all the way down to uh, pass Arseni. And over there, of course, KL Tower, this is the hill, Bukit Nanas, Eco Park, all that good stuff is over there. Yeah, surrounded by giants. There's the Ambank with their camel logo. And then I remembered how I dealt with this before, and it turns out that you can do one of two things. If you have email going to your website, to something like RoundCube, you can do two things in order to get them somewhere else. One thing you can do is set up a forwarder. And I don't really understand all the differences, but as far as I understand the system, if you use a forwarder, it will take the email that's sent to RoundCube to your website and then it will send a copy somewhere else. So you can put in any email address you want. So what you would do is put in your Gmail address. So even though the email was sent to Doug, well, in this case, I have a new one. The email was sent to info at planetdoug.life. That's the email address somebody uses. That email will show up in my personal Gmail account because it's forwarded to that account. But then apparently there were restrictions built into that system. And in order to have total control, to be able to interact with people, reply to emails, organize them, label them, do all the things you need to do, you can't just forward them. Then you have to set up Gmail as your official email client. So in my Gmail account now, I have several identities because in my Gmail account, I'm getting emails from Google, my regular Google Gmail account, and I'm getting emails from all of my Planet Doug email addresses. They all show up in Google, in Gmail. And then when I reply to them, I get a drop down menu and I can choose my persona, my alias. So when I'm replying to one of these emails, I can choose to reply as Planet Doug, or I can reply as Doug Nienheis. I can choose from all of my different aliases. So I had to do all of that, figure out how to do all of that. And of course, at every stage, nothing would work because when you set up Google, you set up Gmail as a client, it requires all this technical information 
you need a pop three port you need a this port number and you have a selection it could be 993 992 21 it's got a whole bunch of these different ports and then you have to tell gmail which port you wanted to use to get your planet doug emails and uh i follow all the instructions none of it works and i basically just have to experiment and just put in port number after port number after port number until i stumble across one that works <laughs> oh man what an adventure that was so whew, hot and muggy looking across KL Tower with all of its neighbors. Yeah, KL Tower always looks much taller than it really is because the base of it is sitting on top of a hill already. So it has a head start over all the other buildings. And this is the wall that I was talking about. There's some sort of a project going on behind that wall. But that wall's been there for years. There's some sort of property back there. Somebody's gonna do something with it, but uh, they haven't started yet. I've jumped ahead in time a little bit. It's now the next day in the afternoon, actually. And I'm heading out to, do, uh, to run a couple of errands. I can't remember why now, but yesterday, when I was coming back from the uh, Hutong food court, after meeting up with Justin, um, I wasn't able to wind up the video. I wasn't able to finish it. Maybe the batteries died. I, I don't know. Something happened. I can't remember what. But in any event, I'm back and I'm just going to wind up the video with some final thoughts. I had a couple of other uh, YouTube videos I wanted to talk about. This first one uh, is from a channel called Exotic Vacations. And uh, let me look up the exact name of the video because I forget. It was something about the perfect itinerary for three days in Kuala Lumpur. But I want to get the name exactly right. Here it is. Exotic Vacations, How to Spend Three Days in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, the Perfect Travel Itinerary. And I'm not quite sure why I wanted to talk about it. It's not a personal travel blog in any way. It's very much a tourism blurb. Again, giving a three-day itinerary for someone who wants to go on a holiday, like a, a pleasurable vacation, but they want to go to somewhere slightly more exotic. So speaking, say, from an American audience point of view, if they're heading off on a holiday like that, they might naturally pick a resort in the Caribbean, Costa Rica, something that's quite safe. And then if you expand their worldview and they want to have an exotic vacation from an American point of view, you could suggest a place like Kuala Lumpur. To someone like me, it feels fairly normal and natural a place but maybe to the average American, Kuala Lumpur is qu considered to be quite exotic. So, that's what this channel is all about. It's not a personal story. I don't even know who makes the videos. It's not a travel vlog. They obviously put these together to give people an idea of what there is to see and do in various places around the world. And it's all very glossy, very fast paced, very upbeat. For my, personal, for my personal taste, way too upbeat, too shrill, too, too, just too much, too much of everything, too much excitement, too much tourism. Um, but again, I did find the video interesting because I was talking about how travel vloggers, they all fail the Planet Doug Batu Caves test for various reasons. And oddly enough, this pure tourism commercial video, they did much better at the Batu Caves test than any travel vlogger that I've come across recently. So again, it wasn't a, uh, an individual's personal story, but they actually, in the video, they talked about Batu Caves more knowledgeably, and they knew that it was a sacred site for Hindus, and they recommended going there by train. 
that you could take the local commuter train to get there. They even knew, which kind of astonishes me, they knew that there were other caves there and they mentioned them. I've been to all these different caves, but I've never once heard another YouTuber even mention them, let alone visit them or, or feature them in photographs or video or anything like that. Because you do have the main cave, everybody just talks about Batu Caves, but as far as I understand it, the big cave is called the, you could call it the Temple Cave or the Cathedral Cave, I think there's two different names for it. But other than that, there's also the Ramayana uh, Cave, which is quite interesting, tells the, uh, the entire story. Um, I'm not sure I'm saying it properly now that the word came out of my mouth. Ramayana? Let me uh, look that up as well. Yes, that is the right word, of course. It, yeah, it just feels weird as I say it. I feel like I'm saying it wrong. But anyway, there's that cave, and there's also the cave villa. And both of those you pay to go in to these caves. But no other travel vlogger seems to be aware of these caves. They've never gone into them or featured them or talked about them in any way. And yet this tourism video knew about them. And yet this tourism video also made mistakes because it was talking about all the different caves you can visit and they mentioned the dark cave. And that kind of got my attention as of the dark cave because I've been to the dark cave. I can't remember if I shot a video there or not because before I started shooting YouTube videos, I did have a kind of a, a website very similar to what I do on video. And I, I went to the dark cave and I wrote about it at length, I remember. So maybe I made a blog post about it with a lot of photographs and I didn't actually record any video. But anyway, I've been to the dark cave. I know what it is. You pay to go in and it's uh, it's sort of an uh, ecological experience. You're going into a cave in its natural state and you learn about all of the creatures that live in the cave and the formation of it, the geology. It's a scientific sort of uh, experience to go into the dark cave. However, it's closed. It's been closed for years as far as I'm aware. I think it, I think it shut down in 2019. I did a little bit of reading just now and apparently they closed out of concerns for the environment, like conserving the natural environment in the cave. Apparently there's a, a spider that lives in this cave that lives nowhere else. It's unique to this cave and they were worried that having so many visitors would hurt this spider and it would go extinct. And there were concerns about safety in this cave because, well, for whatever reason, it is the dark cave it's a real cave, it's not a polished, renovated cave full of temples. It's still in its natural state. And I guess there were safety concerns on top of concerns for the environment. And they shut it down. It's been, uh, it's been closed since 2019. And yet this brand new tourism video, which has all the tourism bells and whistles, was saying, hello, oh, when you go to Batu Caves, make sure, like, don't miss the dark cave you got to go see the dark cave. You know, very loud, very shrill, talking about all these things you're supposed to do and see. But uh, yeah, there is no dark cave anymore. So I started wondering, how could that happen? Because I noticed other things too, that in the, the video title, they misspelled Kuala Lumpur. I mean, the entire video is about what to see and do in Kuala Lumpur on your exotic vacation, but then the video was so carelessly thrown together that they misspelled the name of the city itself. How do you miss something like that? And as I watched the video, there were little, little weird mispronunciations of words, the way we would say things in English, a local word from here in Malaysia, and the video, the guy speaking on the video just kind of gave it a weird twist, like the word was completely unfamiliar to him. So by the time I was finished watching this video, I haven't watched all of it. I couldn't take the guy's voice for the whole video. Um, 
I started to wonder whether this whole thing was done by an AI. And that's sort of a new thing in our life now where we have to question everything. I watch a video on YouTube. I have thoughts and opinions about it, mistakes that are in the video. And then as part of thinking about anything now, we always have to wonder, was that done by an AI or done by a human being? That's just a part of our world now. I find that quite interesting. And something else that's interesting about that is I started to use this AI idea as an insult. So if I'm, if I'm reading something or I'm watching a video and there's something strange about it or there's something poorly done about it, something that's off about whatever it is I'm reading or looking at or listening to, I start thinking, huh, I think it was done by an AI. And I mean that as a criticism, that because it was so poorly done or so weird, it must have been an AI, not a human being that did it. So it's kind of interesting <laughs> that there's all this concern about AIs and the effect it's going to have on society and doing all of our work for us and it's going to take away everybody's job. And of course, eventually an AI is going to become self-aware, like in all the Terminator movies and decide to launch the nuclear weapons and wipe out the human race. We're all terrified of AI. And yet whenever I see something and I think it's really poorly done, my first thought is, oh, it's probably done by an AI. So, <laughs> yeah, maybe we don't have to worry about AI quite that much yet. Anyway, there's something weird about this video that it was slapped together really quickly without a lot of fact checking and clearly kind of a YouTube money grab, just trying to target a very specific audience looking for three-day itinerary for an exotic vacation. And in the description, I see there's a whole bunch of these exotic vacation videos from places all around the world. And it says over top of them, videos from the last two weeks or something like that. So it's almost like this AI pumped out a hundred of these videos all at once, just picked, like someone wrote instructions into a AI system and said, write a script for a three-day itinerary to visit Kuala Lumpur, including all the most popular tourist attractions. And then the AI spit out this script, which is way over the top, way too excited, way too many adjectives, the way an AI would write it. So, yeah, it does make me wonder. And also including outdated information, saying you must visit the dark cave, even though the dark cave hasn't existed uh, for five years. And how did they uh, not even know that? Anyway, exotic vacations. I thought that video was kind of cool, kind of interesting. Another YouTube video jumped out at me recently, and this one was from a channel called, I believe, Tilly Two Wheels. And it's the first video in what is supposed to be a long series about a motorcycle journey around the world. <laughs> you have to, uh, very tricky intersection right here cars come at you from all directions you gotta look look in all directions listen to what your mother taught you look both ways here in Malaysia it's like look all ways before you cross the road but yeah Tilly two wheels and uh, their their story it's a Western couple a married couple man and a woman and it follows a fairly typical pattern where the one of the videos is all about, or, or maybe in this video they talk about it, that we quit our job, sold all of our possessions, and now we're going to travel around the world. You, you see that all the time. It's like so many people are posting videos about how they quit their jobs, sold all their possessions, and they end up getting super admired for this. They get a lot of praise about this amazing adventure they're going on and how brave they are to do this. And <laughs> I end up wondering, well, what about me? Can I get any of this praise? I mean, I quit my job lots of times, 
sold my possessions, whatever meager possessions I had, and then went somewhere. I wouldn't call it exactly a grand journey around the world or anything like that, but on multiple occasions, I quit my job, got rid of everything I had, and then went somewhere else. But uh, nobody threw a party for me. Nobody had a parade for me. Anyway, I find that kind of funny. So this video is actually called Season 1, Episode 1. So they're sort of doing the itchy boots thing where each year is a new package journey of one location. And they call that a, a season. And this is Season 1, Episode 1. It's the only video that's come out so far that I'm aware of. But mentioning uh, how it's similar to Itchy Boots brings up this other idea because as I was watching the video, I had the feeling that these people have been watching tons of YouTube videos, travel vlogs, and wrote down every idea from all of those videos and had been thinking about this for a long time, had been planning it, and then when they made their very first video, they took every single idea they saw on every video they've ever watched and just dumped them all into this video. Like there's a real risk in doing that. I find I, I run that risk with my own Planet Doug YouTube videos that you can go overboard without realizing it because you look at your video and hardly anybody watched it and you look at some other video on YouTube that has 180,000 views and you look at their video and go, oh, well, they did an introduction. That's why their video is so popular. Or, oh, they did the, the, the thumbnail like this. That's why it's so popular. It's like, oh, they played this kind of music. Oh, they included bloopers. They did these weird transitions that swirl around in a circle. They did slow motion. They did um, rapid motion, what's that called? You know, where you speed everything up. And you see all these fancy video features all over the place and you think, well, I should start doing things like that. And you start putting them in your own video because you think people will love it and your videos will become more widely popular. But, but before you know it, you've turned your video into a bit of a circus. You've put in way too many graphics, way too many fancy things, way too many songs. And this video from Tilly Two Wheels had all of it and the kitchen sink. Just, they threw everything at, into the video. I think music played as soon as the video started and it never stopped. It was just an ongoing musical beat. And it was that high-pitched, weird kind of YouTube music that Casey Neistat made famous. So I think they were watching Casey Neistat videos and then they um, thought, oh, that's, that's YouTube music. It's really popular. Let's use that. So they put that into their video, but they had it playing the entire time from beginning to end. It was in the background always playing. Yeah, there was a lot. And it felt overall, construction, Malaysia, it felt overall like they were trying so hard in this video. And uh, I felt a little bit of empathy because I could see myself doing the same thing. There's one sequence in particular when they were on their motorcycle. Uh, I think I better turn around. There's a guy up ahead. I, uh, behind me, just a homeless guy there. I, uh, don't really want to walk by him. You never quite know what's going to happen with a guy like that. And uh, when they see a foreigner, they often get fixated on foreigners, drunk people and homeless people and sort of um, unbalanced people will zero in on me. So best to keep my distance sometimes. So I'm just going to turn around and walk back this way. Um, yeah, there was one sequence on the motorcycle. He was at a traffic light waiting for the, the light to turn red and he was looking at the other vehicles around him and he just decided to do this joke where he was narrating a race 
giving a countdown as if everybody at the red light was competing in the Indy 500 or something. And then he started narrating as if he was some sort of a sports commentator. And they're at the starting line, the countdown, and they're off. And the red vehicle is going. Oh, now the blue is, you know, and this went on for such a long time. And I thought, man, we got the joke. You can stop now. But it, again, I think he was so into this idea of all these, your video is supposed to be upbeat. It's supposed to be exciting. It's supposed to be funny. It's got to have sound effects. It's got to have music. It's got to have graphics. They just threw everything they could into that video. And it ended up being a, a bit much, I thought. But I only bring that up, not as a criticism of their video, but as a, an idea of something that you have to be careful of as a YouTuber, because I think everybody can fall prey to that. But of course, any, um, any thoughts I have about this video are kind of silly, because that video has 40,000 views, hundreds of comments, talking about how wonderful it is. So I'm sort of a lone voice in the wilderness <laughs> where I see things in the video. I was like, yeah, I don't know about that. And, uh, but uh, if I knew what I was uh, doing, of course, um, my videos would have uh, 40,000 views, <laughs> which they don't. So who am I to say anything? I'm actually coming up here to the um, Selections grocery store. And it's right here, which is why I'm sort of walking back and forth now. My story isn't finished yet. But once my story is done, then I'll pop into the uh, grocery store. But, um, so anyway, their journey started in Singapore. Tilly Two Wheels. Tilly is the name of their motorcycle, by the way. And they shipped their motorcycle in a crate to Singapore. The big, heavy, expensive looking motorcycle. I, I don't know the model, the brand, or the engine size or anything but it looked like a big fancy motorbike and they had it shipped there so their journey started in Singapore and then they rode through Singapore into Malaysia into and on into uh, Thailand but I had a couple other reactions one was when did people start traveling and then the country they're in becomes irrelevant because they blew through Singapore blew through Malaysia and I don't remember them saying anything at all about either country. You could watch their video and if someone gave you a quiz on Singapore based on what was in the video, you wouldn't know anything. Or Malaysia, like uh, how many people live in that country? What's their population size? Uh, anything about the history? What language do they speak? What is the economy based on? Are they, is it a rich country, a poor country? Like nothing. But I remember even from a very young age, if I ever thought about going to any other country, a big part of my motivation was to learn things about that country. But now when I watch all these YouTube travel vlogs, the country that they're in is always somewhat irrelevant information about that country almost never comes up. It's all about the person and, and what they're doing for the video. And it doesn't seem like anybody actually pays attention to the country. Or maybe they do and they just don't put it in the video. But this, this is something, a pattern that I've noticed. A couple last things. Um, one thing I, realized, I learned, I didn't know, when they crossed the border into Malaysia, they went to get gas and they went to a gas station and they wanted to get 95, that type of gas. But then it wouldn't work for them or they, they saw a big sign saying that foreigners, you're not allowed to get this gas. This is only for locals. And they were, they were told they had to buy more expensive gas. The cheapest type of gas was not open. You, foreigners couldn't do it. You had to buy, because you're a foreigner, you had to buy the expensive gas. And I was like, huh. I mean, I, I've never ridden a motorized vehicle here. I've never gotten gas. So I, didn't, I haven't run into this. But I learned later on, it's because the one type of gas is subsidized for Malaysian people. And they had this problem with people from Singapore 
just driving across the border to Malaysia and filling up their tanks because gas was so much cheaper in Malaysia. They just drive into Johor Bahru, fill up their tank, and then drive back to Singapore. And uh, that's not what the cheap gas was meant for. It was meant for Malaysians, not for foreigners. And uh, someone told me that to prevent this, they now have a law that if you cross the border from Singapore into Malaysia, your gas tank, it must be three quarters full or else they won't let you across. And if they catch you going across with an empty tank, they will give you a very hefty fine. So it's a law now. Your tank has to be at least three quarters full to go across that border. Yeah, none of this I knew, so that was new. And the last thing, it's quite interesting, when they crossed into Malaysia, boy, do I pick the wrong place to stand, the uh, jackhammers over there. Uh, when they crossed into Malaysia, they saw a big billboard. And uh, on the billboard, there was a photograph of a, of a man making a heart symbol with his hands, putting his hands together to make a heart. And while they were waiting for the light to change, they made a comment, a kind of made a joke about that man in the uh, billboard, and they called him a creepy old man. And I, I was sort of startled when they said that, because I wouldn't risk doing that myself. You never know who you're talking about, right? And it turned out that the man in this billboard was the Agong. He was the Sultan of Johor Bahru, and the Sultan of Johor Bahru is currently the King of Malaysia. So they essentially said something a little bit insulting about the King of Malaysia. And once I, once I figured that out, I, I went to the comments and sure enough, Malaysians by the dozens told them in the comments, that's our King, that's our King, that's our King. You should be careful, make sure you're careful. Telling them over and over again that that man in the billboard was the King of Malaysia. And of course, in my case, had I made a mistake like that, and someone told me in the comments, man, I couldn't delete that video fast enough, I would delete it, edit out that part, and then I, I would re-upload it. But it's been uh, several weeks since that video was finished and posted, and they haven't done that, so it's still there. Um, and everybody from Malaysia keeps, all, everybody new that watches the video, and every new viewer keeps telling them that's the king, but uh, right now they're fine with it and they, um, they haven't, uh, yeah, they haven't uh, deleted that part. They haven't, I think in YouTube itself, you could, if you wanted to, without deleting the video, you could go into the YouTube studio and mute sections or delete the audio of individual sections without having to remove the whole video. And I would definitely have done that, but uh, no, they've left it up there so far. And the last thing they do, again, this gets back to my idea. I got the impression that they were looking for every idea they could think of in advance, intending to use all these ideas in their trip and in their video and just put them all in. And one of their ideas was to have a dog counter. So they're gonna ride their motorcycle around the world and they're going to count every single dog they see on the entire journey. So. We'll see if they manage to keep that up, because I think they have an interest in uh, animal welfare, rescuing stray dogs, and in this case, every time they see a stray dog, they're gonna add a number to their stray dog counter. Maybe the original idea was to bring awareness to the issue of uh, homeless dogs, stray dogs, I'm not sure, but that's what they're doing, they have the uh, dog counter on their video but I don't know there's a lot of dogs in the world I couldn't imagine keeping track of all of them and keeping your count up to date we'll see so that is a Tilly Tilly two wheels they're already through Malaysia they're already in Thailand I think this video took so much time to produce to edit and upload that they're way way behind in terms of time so they're there they've they've left Malaysia long ago but uh, I'm looking forward to their next video. Curious to see what they come up with next. So, time to do some shopping at uh, Selections.
and I jumped ahead in time once again. I've already done all my errands, bought some goodies, bring back to my hotel. And I had some other things to talk about, but I never quite got around to it. So for this behind the scenes video, I'm going to wind things up here, just about back at my hotel. I can feel rain in the air. I got here just in time. It's gonna start pouring down any second. I have about a minute to get back to my hotel. <laughs> I can feel the wind too. So that's it, shutting down uh, for this behind the scenes video. Thank you to uh, Justin for giving me a tour of the Hutong food court, lot 10. That was really interesting. Good meal, interesting uh, conversation. Enjoyed that quite a bit. So that's it, shutting down. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.